So we're on. Hello, everybody. While we wait for more people to join us, we'll kick off in about five or so minutes. But while more people are arriving, if you'd like to click on that little chat icon, see there's a little speech bubble down the bottom. If you'd like to click on chat, and if you could add your name, where you're from, and your favourite Australian animal. So while people are doing that, Kelly, mm -hmm. what's your favourite Australian mm -hmm. animal? Hi everyone, I'm Kelly. Um, I we were just talking um, about <laughs> favourite Australian animals, and Jess has got this wonderful. He'll tell you about it, and he had this really long, detailed reason why he loved this animal. And I said, well, I like wombats because they do square poo. And I think that's quite unique to the animal world. And also, I just love how they own their habitat. And I've been camping down in Victoria, Wilson's Prom, uh, and um, there's a lot of wombats down there. And if you do not have a zip on your tent that works very well, they come straight in for a visit. And it's very hard to reason with a wombat to exit your tent. Uh, they don't speak English very well, and you can't pick them up. So I love wombats. They're fantastic. Um, do, you, do you know why they're poo is square, Kelly? Uh, I do, I think, but I don't know if this is true. It's one of those things you read and then kind of forget, but it's, is it territorial? Yes. And, um, balance. and yeah, so it balances, it doesn't roll down hills and logs yeah. and things. So you can mark your territory. Better with square poo. Yeah. Right. Brilliant. So we have a bunch of people joining the call. We have Susan who loves wallabies, galahs, possums. We have Lisa from Adelaide who loves actually a few platypuses. Lisa loves platypuses. Platypi. Platypi. Um, we have Dom who loves cassowaries. We have John from Brisbane who loves platypuses because they're seriously quirky, just like lots of, lots of other Australians. Um, Nicole from Melbourne who loves I kookaburras. Love kookaburra. yeah. Yeah. Echidnas from uh, Corrine in the South Coast. Jess, do you want to tell everyone your favourite? So my favourite animal is a Tasmanian betong, and it's this really beautiful small wallaby that used to be on the mainland but was driven to extinction because of cats and foxes. Um, and it's got long skinny grey legs and a long grey tail and it lives in the dry forests in Tasmania where I used to live as well. And it's unique amongst the macropods, so they're the can kangaroo and wallabies, you know, the guys with the, the women with the big feet, macropod. Um, it has a prehensile tail, which means that like a possum, it can actually use its tail and pick things up, curl grass up and nesting materials in its tail and hop along carrying things. And it actually uses its tail to build a nest and they have this quite amazing dome-shaped nest that they hide inside. Um, and they're just really special and I like them. And I saw one um, over the summer when I was in Tassie bushwalking off track in my old bit of bush. So that was nice. Wow. Yeah. So just um, for the people who are, who are just joining us, welcome. We're just waiting a few minutes to get started while more people join us. Um, and while we're waiting, if you'd like to type into the chat, there's a little speech bubble icon if you click on that. And if you'd like to type in your name, where you're from and your favourite animal. So we have Liz from Eastern, Mon uh, Eastern Melbourne who loves wombats um, and Beatrice from Sydney who loves all animals and Kath who likes the giant cuttlefish today. Ah, mm. they're cool. Yeah, so people coming, calling in from right across Australia. We have Brenda and Annie from Denmark in Western Australia who love honey possums. Do you know about honey possums? Mm, common names. Beautiful different name. used names in different places for the same thing. So I'm not sure what a honey possum is. Yeah. And um, we have Joel from Melbourne who loves cassowaries, another cassowary mm -hmm. lover. Mm -hmm. Robin from Dutton Park in Brisbane. Too many to choose from. I, yeah. I can I share that sentiment. It's hard to choose. Um, birds from the Central Highlands, says Alison from Melbourne. So hello to everybody who's just joining us. We're just waiting a few officially kick off um, and just sharing our favourite animal, your name and where you're from, if you just want to type into the chat. And Jess, I, I think cassowaries are cool animals. I'm with Joel. Um, and I think that's one of the species, If tell me if I'm wrong here, but one of the species where we actually have successfully helped that species start to recover in this country through concerted efforts through recovery plans. That's what I'm hearing from the folks, I think, that are in doing the recovery plans way up in North Queensland. Right. Is that right? Am um, I making that up? I haven't heard that. Right. Um, there's it's probably a, hot off the press and my <laughs> mates in Bidlock. There's, there's different um, groups of cassowaries. There's a northern group and a southern group. The mm -hmm. ones that are further north, um, further away from the cars and the dogs, 
and the urban development are doing much better. The southern ones, which are down around Cairns and yeah, further Mission south, Mission Beach, Beach yeah. they're struggling. Um, but they are incredible creatures. North of the Daintree, um, I was up there making a video for ACF and um, we saw quite a few, which was totally awesome. Yeah. And we saw chicks as well, which look nothing like their parents. Mm. And also, like, uh, quite inquisitive. So we were out hiking, a little chick came walking up to us and I looked behind it, seeing its dad. I'm like, walk away <laughs> from the chick, you know, and it just was so interesting, it kept following us. And yeah, we tried to get out of their way as soon as we could. Good idea. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So we are just at one o'clock. We'll just give people a couple more minutes for the late stragglers to join us. Um, and we've got lots of people jumping on the call. It looks like several hundred already. Um, so welcome everybody. If you'd like to jump onto the chat, leave your name, where you're from and one animal you love. Just while we're waiting for the people to arrive, we're sharing What's about. your favourite animal, Australian animal, Tessa? I was sort of hoping you wouldn't ask that because, like a few people in the chat, I find that really hard mm. to answer. I, I really love emus. I can remember camping and driving through a forest and a mum emu and a few babies. We were driving really slowly but kind of ran in front of our car and the mum fell over. She got such a, she was so flustered and got such a shock that she was this incredible, enormous, quite operatic looking emu kind of blah, 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 on the floor, legs in the ground and got up and kept on running. So encounters like that mm. make me love it. Makes you love more. Uh, isn't it though, it's, it's often the encounters we have that make us yeah. really love yeah, an yeah, animal, isn't it? it? Is. So it's, it's a really good reason why people and nature coming together and getting us out there in nature in a way that protects it, but connecting yeah. is so important yeah. to caring about it yeah. and taking action. Excellent. Okay, well, it being 102, I think let's get started. Yeah. So, welcome everybody. It is so wonderful to see all of these comments and all of these names from people in places right across the country. My name's Tessa, and I'm from the ACF Australian Conservation Foundation engagement team. Um, and before we kick off, I'd like to acknowledge that Jess and Kelly and I are meeting today on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and people were from all kinds of different um, nations that we're meeting in today. So I invite all of us to find out a little bit more about the places, the traditional land and the First Nations people who are custodians of the land, wherever you might be. Um, and I invite us all to look to First Nations people for leadership, and for resilience on how we can care for country today and moving forward. So we're here today, it looks like in the chat lots of people are here today because we love nature. We love wildlife and animals and we live on a really quite extraordinary continent. So we love nature and we want our children and our grandchildren to be able to keep enjoying all of the incredible wildlife that you're talking about today, now and into the future. But this summer has been hard. It's been hard to get out into nature, depending on where you are in the country. Um, it's been hard to breathe. Um, it's been, I found it really hard to read the news, mm -hmm. really hard to bear witness to what's happening to the places we love and the wildlife we love and the people and communities we love. Um, it's been just a really devastating summer. Mm -hmm. But equally, right behind those waves of fire and devastation have been incredible waves of kindness and generosity and resilience and people doing truly extraordinary things. Um, and right across Australia, I've been noticing the news and on social media and hearing from friends, um, people you know, tending to injured wildlife and cooking meals for firefighters and really coming together and looking after each other. So we're here today because together we need to keep doing that extraordinary stuff not just in the aftermath of the fires, but in the months and the years and the decades to come. So nature needs us now more than ever before. So today we're, we're bringing our community together to really, to have a good look at our nature strategy that we're just getting ready to launch, to look at what it is that we as a community, the most important things that we can do right now um, for nature. So, on that note, I'd like to introduce two of our speakers today. Uh, we have Kelly O'Shaughnessy, um, the ACF CEO, our fearless leader, who will dig into the situation that we're in, um, the bushfires and how nature and wildlife in Australia are faring right now and what nature needs. Um, and then we have our, our 
nature campaigner Jess Abrahams, um, nature campaigner extraordinaire, who will take us through the strategy of what we together can do um, to really shift this situation and turn this around. And then a little bit later this afternoon today, we'll hear from Carol Ride, who is dialing in um, from interstate and she's a psychologist and founder um, of Psychology for a Safe Climate. So a little later, she'll also share some tips on how we can keep going. So how we can, you know, I've personally found it really overwhelming at times and the grief and the, you know, the devastation, it's, it's hard to stay resilient. So she'll give us some tips on how to keep going and how to cope and support each other and support ourselves. And finally, we'll dig into an action that we can all do right now. Um, a one first thing that we can do to protect nature. Um, so stick around at the very end for some advice on how to write a submission um, for much stronger laws. And Jess will explain what it all means, why now and how to do it. So before we jump in some very quick housekeeping, um, we could talk about this stuff all day. We would love to talk about this stuff all day, but we only have an hour. So I'll keep us quite strictly to time. Um, we have several hundred people on the call. So while we would love to answer all of your questions, um, there are so many people and so many questions. We'll do our very best. We encourage you to jump into the chat and type away. We've got a team of people who can answer your questions there. We'll also have an opportunity a little bit later in the session um, where we'll answer a few questions and we also invite you to a brand new Facebook group that we've just set up um, called Nature Network ACF and we'll send the link around for that to continue the conversation after this. We'll also be recording this webinar so we can share it with the people who didn't join us today. So if you've just joined us I'd like to welcome you warmly um, to this session about nature and ACS new nature campaign. And I'd like to introduce Kelly, our CEO. So Kelly, this has been all over the news. Um, finally, extinction is on the front page mm. and it's been a really hard summer. So what does that mean for nature in Australia? Um, so it has been a really hard summer and I um, haven't actually had to speak about it publicly, so I hope I don't burst out in tears in today, uh, but I'm well trained not to. Uh, <laughs> It's um, these bushfires that we're seeing and that are honing everyone's attention is a symptom of climate change. We know that and it's they're much worse um, because of climate change. Um, but before these fires, we had an extinction crisis in Australia. We so we had 2000 species um, that, that are threatened, that were threatened in Australia. We don't know how they're faring right now after these fires. Um, we don't know how many have been pushed closer to extinction but the way that we run this magnificent country that we live in actually is threaten, threatening extinction and these bushfires have made it much much worse mm -hmm. um, and that's because we're clearing their home their habitat we need to stop doing that uh, and it's because we're pumping climate pollution up into our atmosphere and that warming planet is making fires worse that we're just seeing so we know that this hottest decade that we've just gone through um, has made these bushfires worse and over 18 million hectares of our beautiful country of the home of the animals that we've all been writing down that we love has been lost and burned and destroyed we didn't lose it we know where it is but it has been destroyed through these fires and uh, at least a billion animals are dead. Um, the number will be significantly higher than that, we believe. Um, and of course, as we know, um, the fires are one thing, the recovery, the rescue, the feeding, avoiding starvation of these critters um, is, may have a far greater impact on that number. So we know things like 80% of the Blue Mountains, um, incredible World Heritage Area has been burnt, 30% of Victorian National Parks, um, and the habitat of 325 national threatened plant and animal species has been burnt of those 2,000. And that includes in critters like the koala that a lot of people have put up there today, the greater glider, which have the most incredible ears that I've ever seen in the history of animals, the brush-tailed rock wallabies, um, so this, this is a major problem for our extinction crisis, but it's not a, not a problem that we didn't already have. It just makes the recovery much worse. 
and um, you know we need emergency action to help wildlife recover but we also need to stop destroying the habitat so we actually need emergency action by our governments to stop logging in these areas or land clearing in these areas that may be the last remaining habitat for a threatened species we don't know because we need to get out onto the ground we being the scientists not acf out on the ground to assess the damage mm -hmm. But I also just wanted to point out to everyone that actually what we've seen in these fires is what is um, on our minds right now because most Australians have experienced, in the East Coast, most of Australians have experienced these fires in one way or the other, and particularly through air pollution for most of us. But it is the last in a very long list of damage that we're seeing from climate change. So we've all seen the reef bleaching. We've seen forests that are usually too wet to burn catch on fire. We've said a million dead fish in the Darling River. Um, so this is what happens when we don't care for our planet. Um, and uh, we need to make really big change if we are going to protect this place that we all love and the wildlife that we all love. Yeah. So Kelly, what can we as concerned citizens and the hundreds and hundreds of people on this call, um, what can we do about this? Well, I think there's two levels of things we can do. And it's amazing, you know, in crisis, one of the things I love the most is how humans come together. Yeah. And it doesn't matter where you live or who you vote for or how you take your coffee in the morning, that generosity of human beings to each other and to other living things is extraordinary. And it kind of helps me keep going, actually. Um, and we need to do two levels of things. We need to do the emergent emergency action that is being done and ACF doesn't do the emergency action out on the ground feeding wildlife protecting them rescuing it but we do go with the groups who do up to Canberra recently to lobby ministers at the federal level and state level to invest in that to support the groups that do that mm -hmm. and there's little things that um, we all could do if you know leaving water out for wildlife for example um, but actually if we are going to make sure that this is not the new normal we, we have to change the systems. We have to fix the systems that are behind these bushfires. That means we have to actually fix climate change. Mm. And we actually have to protect habitat that is remaining, which is also known as a home of the critters. So we're going to need billions of dollars worth of investment. We don't know how much because we've got to get out and do that assessment first. But let me tell you, we are asking for $1 billion a year um, before these fires to be spent on restoring nature. So we're going to be having to ask for a lot more than that. Um, and we need to fix the systems. So the only way you do that is by building people power. Because we need laws in this country that stop extinction. We need to switch from burning coal to clean energy. Um, we need the billions of dollars to restore habitat. Um, so these are huge changes. We need mass tree planting you know someone asked me last night what do you do to save the world and i said stop polluting putting stuff up in the atmosphere plant some really important trees for biodiversity they're the two biggest things we can do across the world and in this country um, and so we have the solutions here but what we know is that it's really political climate is political unfortunately our environment and protecting it is also highly political and highly partisan. So the, which is frustrating, um, the best way around that though is to build a huge wave of people to take action. So if you think about every major change that's ever happened in the world's history to, um, to have big change, whether it's to be giving women the vote, whether it's to stop apartheid or civil rights, civil rights came after people took action. And, uh, we need to get together uh, and speak up and take action. So that's really what a bit of today is. But I also um, want everyone to remember that we also need to focus on changing the big systems, fixing the systems. If we just work on the, the symptoms, like if we only just help the wildlife recover from these fires, we'll be in trouble. And uh, if, in case you are feeling a bit overwhelmed, you know, just think forward. This is the start of a decade think forward um, to the end of it. And if you could imagine, if we look back and we're seeing solar panels on everyone's roofs, we're seeing this power, this country powered through clean energy. Um, we are seeing the koalas that we love munching away on gum trees. Wouldn't it be really amazing if we could see that 
we could show our kids that and then we could say, well, actually, you know what? We did that because we spoke up. Yeah, and as I've just noticed in the chat, Jean um, says, yes, a huge wave of people power to create systemic change. Yes, yeah. go Jean, I agree. So if you've just joined us, um, welcome. We're here to, to talk all things nature, what we can do together um, to help nature in Australia. So I'd like to introduce Jess Abrahams, who's our nature campaigner at ACF. Jess, can you talk us through what's the strategy? So how do we do this? A really pivotal decade? Yeah. People, power, systems change. What are we? What's the strategy? A pivotal decade and a pivotal moment right now because we have national attention mm -hmm. and we actually have some political engagement on nature, which doesn't happen a lot often. Mm -hmm. I can summarise it in the most simplest terms like this. We need to protect, we need to restore, and we need to connect. Now, what do I mean by each of those things? I'm going to run through them and I'm going to give you some tangible examples. So hopefully that'll help people understand. So protect, like the devastation of these fires means that now more than ever, we need to protect the best of what's left. Now that means the unburnt habitat of the threatened species, like the greater glider, so Kelly mentioned, 25% of its habitat just burned, but there's logging in Victoria, there's logging in the other 75% of its habitat right now. While the fires were burning, they were logging its habitat. So there's a big call right now to um, put a moratorium on you know, logging and land clearing until we even get a grasp of what's happened. But it's not just about those remote and beautiful wild places that we need to protect. We actually need to protect the nearby nature, mm -hmm. the unburnt habitat that's actually in many of our backyards. And it's an amazing statistic I've learnt recently, and this was an eye-opener for me. 46% of Australia's threatened species actually live in urban areas, cities and towns, essentially people's backyards. And um, we have a unique opportunity to actually protect nearby nature. And that's really important from a biodiversity perspective, but it's also a really important from a people and a politics perspective. And I'll get to that in a moment. The other thing that we need to do is a kind of protect nature at a national and a systemic level. And we've talked a little bit about national environment laws. It's a journey to get strong laws, but right now there is a moment in the laws campaign. Our national laws are under review, and I'm going to talk at the end about how you can make a submission and help us secure stronger laws in the meantime. So there's the protect piece, really important. We need to protect locally, we need to protect nationally and systemically, but we also need to restore our ecosystems. Like there's been a massive impact from these fires, a huge restoration effort will be needed, billions of dollars of investment. But it's not just restoring nature out there. We also need to restore the nature that's nearby to us, that's in our backyards. And part of what we want to do with this campaign is actually give people a really hands-on, tangible experience. And I'm sure many ACF supporters have had this before, of doing some local tree planting or weeding or some other kind of nature restoration, river cleanup. And there's a really good reason why we want people to have that hands-on experience. Um, it gives you a tangible sense of making a difference, but it's also a great way to get new people in. And getting people in, getting more people on board and having an experience, a positive experience of protecting the environment is going to be critical. ACF, this is not ACF's natural territory. Normally we just do advocacy. We put on a shirt and tie and fly off to Canberra and try to convince politicians. We're going to get our hands dirty. And I'm very excited about that in this campaign because there's something really tangible for people about making a difference in their own communities. Now, we know these tree planting activities are really good because they can bring in those new audiences. And there's many people in our ACF base um, who will probably look and feel and sound a bit like me, have similar values. That's great, and you guys too, people on the call, but we've got to, we've got to diversify. Mm. Our supporter base is fantastic and strong, but not big enough and not diverse enough, and that's a big part of the challenge. And we think that restoring nature is a way that we can bring more people in. And that connect piece, what does that mean? Well, we need to kind of connect nature, the pockets of unburnt habitat, we need to restore and connect them at a landscape level, but actually we need to connect the people as well. And we need to connect people both with nature, as we were saying, but we actually need to connect people with each other. We need to create a sense of community around protecting the environment. And again, we think that we can use these local, in your backyard, kind of protect and restore activities to do that. And Tess is going to be doing a bit of a poll because we're at the moment developing activities that will connect people 
to each other in their local environment. We've got a sense of what's going to work, but we'd love to get some feedback from you as well. Because local connection really is going to be key. But at the end of the day, if we don't have the people power, we're not going to get the systemic changes we need. The funding we've talked about, the strong laws we need. And we need to reach out beyond our base. We need to reach perhaps more conservative types of people, more conservative voters, because um, the, the, we have the impact, we can make some changes, but the level of power we have is just not great enough. And the, third, the final piece in this is kind of joining the dots. And again, it's, it's part of a connection, but our theory is, is that if we can um, ignite, or oh, that's not the right metaphor right now, spur action in local communities with perhaps new types of people in hands-on conservation activities, and we can do it here, and here, and here, and here, and we can do it all across Australia, we might be able to help some of these communities see that the issues they're experiencing and they're fighting in their backyard, whether it's invasive species, or yet another unsustainable development, or a weak local or national environment law, it's actually pretty similar to the same issues that communities all across the country. And if we can join the dots across the country, that's how we can build the power that's gonna help us fix the system. Great. Okay, so I'm mindful we've just shared a whole lot of information, ideas and strategy with you. You must be bursting with questions. So if you have a look, there's a little speech bubble icon which says chat at the bottom of your screen. So if you'd like to type, press that button and type in some questions, um, we'll do our best to answer a few of them, mindful that there are hundreds of people in this call, so we can't answer them all. But just while you're typing, Jess, I have a question for you. So you've mentioned that people power is key and mm. reaching new audiences mm. really matters. Um, what might that, why is that so important? What might that entail? Well, I mean, I kind of hinted at this before, but um, as a campaigner who's kind of worked on issues as a volunteer and a you know, professional campaigner for 20 years, business as usual, what we've always been, been doing is, is great, but it's actually not great enough. Like mm -hmm. we've, I've been involved and my colleagues have helped and the people on this call have helped protect some really special iconic places. Think of, you know, Kakadu or the reef or some parts of Tassie's forest or Victoria's forest recently. Like we've got some big wins, but in the midst of that, the indicators, the environmental indicators in this country are going backwards. Because business as usual is not working. It's kind of, it feels like a game of whack-a-mole. Like there's that threat and then there's the Adani mine and then you turn around and there's 10 more coal mines or a hundred more, you know, unsustainable, crazy, stupid developments proposed. And ACF alone, and even all the environment movement alone is, we're not winning, we're winning the, the, some of the small comp competitions, but we're not winning the overall game. And we really need to get more people on board because until we can, conservative governments continue to get elected in this country. And ACF supporters, as I mentioned before, um, there's a disproportionate number of Greens and Labor supporters amongst our fantastic supporter base. That's awesome, but it allows Conservative governments to somewhat ignore us. Mm. We know that, I, we've done a lot of research for this campaign. I've gone and spoken to Conservative voters in Conservative communities. They love the environment, they have a really strong connection to it, they express it quite differently <laughs> to we do, but we know that they care about the local nature. And if we can activate some of that concern, and build support for protecting the environment amongst conservative voters as well as regional, urban. So we're getting away from this kind of city bush divide and this kind of greenies, you know, small constituency. That's how we're going to change the system because, you know, we simply don't have the political power we need. We need new people. And we've done quite a bit of research on what kind of people they are, where they live, and how we can target them. And we've really come to the conclusion that some of this hands-on nature restoration and hands-on local campaigns is the way to do it. Yeah. One question, Kelly, maybe you could mm -hmm. respond to. Um, so Deborah has asked, how can we listen to, or can we listen to the traditional owners of our land um, on how to manage the environment? So uh, through climate events, you know, how can we include and better respect and genuinely engage with and act based on their leadership? Mm. And how can we get government to listen to that type of thing too? I think when you live in a continent for 60,000 years and that continent's health is incredible mm. um, before we came to this country, 
it shows that the Indigenous knowledge is profound and deeply linked to this, this country. Um, so we do need to listen to all forms of knowledge, actually, all forms of expertise. We're very good at basing our work on science and scientific expertise, but I, I don't think our country and even ACF does enough work to um, really listen to that Indigenous expertise. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing a lot of calls from Indigenous organisations who are saying, listen to us more on the fires, actually, because we've been burning this nation for a long time. And ACF actually invests in a, um, to offset our emissions that we can't avoid, we uh, invest in an Aboriginal carbon fund and they include um, burning, planned prescribed burning uh, as part of their ways to offset climate. So it is definitely, um, definitely what we need to do. Actually, I don't have time to talk about it here, but um, we are working with uh, Aboriginal Australians right now in a listening in exercise. How to, how do environment groups better respect and listen to Indigenous leaders? Mm -hmm. how, does, how does First Peoples' needs and nature's needs come together in what we can ask for and what they can ask for? Yeah. So we're really challenging ourselves to do a whole lot better. Even though we've got this 50-year history of listening very intently and working with Indigenous Australians, it's not good enough. Yeah. There are lots of questions I'm noticing. I'm just mindful of time, so I need to keep us moving. Mm -hmm. Lots of questions on how can we do these local community-based hands-on activities? So I actually would like to throw a question in a poll to you, to all the hundreds of listeners out there today. Um, so we're, we're, we've got lots of people busy designing toolkits and working out the logistics of some of these initial um, local community nature activities that we're looking at rolling out. So what we're thinking about is, coming up with toolkits for simple activities that people, wherever they are in Australia, can kind of pick up and run with to do different things for nature. So it's sort of like a scalable scaffolding to help people connect with their neighbours and people in their neighbourhoods to start to bring people on a journey to connect more with nature and start learning about threatened species and different birds and creatures that live in areas where we live. Um, to get to know them and start to realise what needs to happen. So we, I wonder about proposing for you three ideas, three different nature restore tactics um, that we might start rolling out a little bit later in February. So one idea that I think I would really like to do with my neighbours is to make, a, make my block a wildlife attracting island. So what would happen if we all knock on the doors of our neighbours and not just make my garden full of natives that attract different kinds of wildlife, um, but make our make the entire block, all the gardens in the block of whoever wants to participate, an oasis. So idea number one that you can do, and we, we can create a toolkit to help you do it, um, make your block a wildlife attracting island. Another one, and a thing that people are already starting to do, is building community community based activities to build nesting boxes. So. Lots of creatures have lost their big old trees and their habitat. So possums, other little furry creatures, birds, gliders, so even insect hotels. So another activity would be to bring people from your community together to create different nesting boxes, either for your local area or to centre fire affected areas. And a third idea is to come together with people in your community to do some citizen science. So to investigate who do you share, which kind of creatures do you share your local area with? Um, you know, count birds, count frogs, different kinds of citizen science activities that we can do and use that local information to inform scientists so that we can work out what it is that local wildlife really needs. So a poll is about to pop up on your screen. If you could click on your favourite idea, um, and we will feed that into our thinking about what kind of activities we're going to launch in February for people to do. So basically it's a little bit of a choose your own adventure and there are lots of different things that different communities will be involved in but what we're interested in is first of all what you are interested in and second of all what you think really diverse people from your community might get involved in as well. And think of these activities in two ways both as something as Tessa said that you want to do but um, as activities that you can perhaps facilitate to bring new people in. Like a nature campaign is about restoring nature, but it's about bringing people in to build the movement so we can get the change at the national level. 
So think of it as what you want to do, but what other people would be attracted to as mm -hmm. well. And there are so many extraordinary things that people are already doing in local communities uh, across Australia and around the world. So we're also looking at what can we link up and how can we make this as big as possible? Lots of different kinds of activities that people enjoy. Okay, so that poll is ticking away. Um, and I would now like to invite Carol Ride, who is um, a trained psychologist and founder of Psychology for a Safe Climate. So while we're just pulling Carol up on the screen, as the scale of the crisis becomes clearer, and as we experience setbacks and you know, really devastating impacts, um, grief and anger can be really overwhelming. And it's a thing that, um, it can be a real challenge to know how to deal with it. So Carol's going to talk to us, share some ideas today about um, how we can look after ourselves um, and how we can deal with burnout and distress because we have a long road ahead of us. There is lots of work to be done and this is a really pivotal decade. So Carol, welcome. Um, and if you could, if you'd like to share with us some coping strategies so that we can, we can rest when we need to and keep going for the long haul. Thanks Tessa and thanks for inviting me. Um, Look, I wanted to talk about grief, um, and it sounds like that's a sort of a negative thing to introduce, but I just want to talk about the importance of grief in the process of engaging more deeply. And I'm sure that um, many of you have found yourselves grappling with grief after the initial shock of, of hearing about the devastating impact of the bushfires and the impact on all the people, the wildlife, the wonderful places we love, the national parks. And I think that we can feel, when we feel grief, it can often feel a gut-wrenching grief, it's sort of like a, 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 a hit in the stomach, and um, it can be quite difficult to recover from. Um, and we can also feel grief about the fact that our governments haven't acted as they, they should have, and we're all warned about this. So what I would just want to talk about is the importance of grieving and, and the process of grieving and how useful it is in achieving the outcome that you're talking about today. And I think we need to remember to honour our grief um, and that we only feel grief because we care so deeply and that we love so deeply. And also that we grieve when we've got the courage to face the real depth of our feelings. Because the more we love, the more we feel we've lost. Um, and to grieve is to recognise that we're not in denial, but we're acknowledging the actual impact of the losses on our lives. And it's been found that if people are sort of trying to push their grief away, it can often, often actually result in them being depressed because they're not actually grappling with the feelings that need to be dealt with. And I'd suggest that when people deal with their grief, that they don't just bury it or hide themselves away and grieve alone, but they actually do join with other people to express their feelings. And this expression may be with others in a friendship, on a friendship basis, or it may be by gathering together people that you might not know deeply, but that you know care deeply about the impact of the losses around the, the bushfires. And if we can join with others, um, it can actually help us enormously to process the feelings we, we've got rather than cycling them around, recycling them inside. But by talking to others about what we're feeling, the losses we feel, and being heard around those feelings is really, really important. It's very healing to know that somebody else has actually heard and acknowledged what you've felt and expressed. And, and to also offer that to others is really a great gift to the other person to actually listen to their grief and acknowledge the feelings they have. Um, I have a little a statement from a, a psychoanalyst who's interested in um, area of grief particularly said, we are waiting for the presence of others before we can feel safe to drop on our knees on the holy ground of sorrow. Yeah. And so he's really emphasising this really important process of being with others. 
Now, some of you may decide that you can talk to friends, but one other idea may be for people to form some sort of gathering in their local community. You've been talking about that as part of the, the tree planting or um, your rewilding nature. And it may be important to begin one of those sorts of gatherings with a, an opportunity to just in a circle talk about the grief you feel. Maybe make some sort of place in the in a circle where people can place some symbolic item that represents the the loss that they feel so deeply about, um, and put into words as they place that symbol on it in some sort of place. It might be a memorial or an altar, or it might be just a place in the middle of a circle. And it really is important to do that articulating with others. I can't emphasise that enough as a way of really doing healthy grieving and helping shift the process along within of the grief not just being sort of held as stagnant within. And one of the um, suggestions that um, um, has been made and ACF's taking that up, the idea of creating a Facebook page where people could put their some some writing or a poem or a drawing or a photo or some art that they've created in response to the bushfires. And it doesn't have to be magnificent art and it doesn't have to be wonderfully fluent writing, but just some way of expressing your own feelings and putting that in some place where others can see it is maybe um, a contribution to help other people find the grief they feel and find expression for it. Um, it's Sally Gillespie, who's recently published a book called um, Climate, The Climate Crisis and Consciousness, says that grief can make us very sad, but it can also make us very motivated to act. And I think that's what we're looking at, people taking action, but they may need to grieve first. And when we grieve, she says, for what is lost, it clears the way for a strength and commitment to what remains. And that's exactly what's been talked about today, about looking after what's remaining of the wonderful um, bushland and species that, that we do have that have fortunately not suffered in the bushfires. So I'll just finish by saying, um, please look out for the link to the Facebook page where you might be able to contribute something of your feelings about the losses around the bushfires. And also ACF is going to um, send around some resources to um, help you nurture your well-being beyond what we're talking about just now. Thanks very much. Thanks, Carol. And lots of, lots of comments um, about ways to connect with, e with each other in our community. Um, so the Facebook group that Carol mentioned feels like a really important, or certainly the idea of connecting, feels like a really important part of this campaign, mm -hmm. protecting, restoring and connecting. And that includes ourselves in our community. So if you open up Facebook and search for ACF Nature Network, you'll find there's a brand new Facebook group that we've just created. Um, we'll also send around an email with links to that, also links to the um, to the self-care toolkit that Carol mentioned and a few other things. So jump into the Facebook group and let's use that as a place to continue these conversations, whether it's about self-care and supporting each other and supporting ourselves and holding the space to really bear witness and acknowledge what it is that we're trying to grapple with, or also to share ideas around these. these you know, there, it looks like the chat is full of incredible ideas of what we can do as local communities to connect together and invite others in to restore nature locally. Um, so let's use this as a place and we'll be constantly dropping in toolkits, ideas, um, troubleshooting. Let's use that as a space to connect. So this takes us to the final part of the webinar. We've talked about the structure of our nature campaign, protect, restore, connect. Now Jess, um, Jess is going to take us on a deep dive into one very specific protect action that we can all take um, right now. So Jess, we've mentioned very briefly that we have these environment laws, national environment laws that are up for review. 
Can you tell us more about why does this matter and what do the laws do? Sure. So Australia's national environment laws are actually 20 years old. And um, at the time, they were okay. Um, they brought together a whole lot of different pieces of rules that were in other bits of legislation. But they're out of date now. Like, they're no longer fit for purpose. And one really clear measure of that is you can't even find the word climate change anywhere in our national environment laws. Wow. Whew. And perhaps even worse for me is that it's not illegal to send a species to extinction. In fact, all the time, our environment ministers make decisions that knowingly send our wildlife to the brink. Um, to me, they're two very simple changes that we could make. But look, the laws are under review right now because every decade, by law, they need to undergo a review. And the review is actually being done by an independent panel, um, obviously appointed by government. Um, that panel has its own website and it has a discussion paper out. So we'll have in that email links to go and have a look at that website. It's kind of flash, it's nice. There's a very long discussion paper out there. But um, we want, we're looking for some quality, um, sub people to do some quality submissions. Okay, so submission, what makes a good submission? Well, um, what is a submission? What is a submission? <laughs> well, look, there's two ways, how to make a submission. There's two ways to do it. On the government's, or on the independent reviews website, there's a kind of a box where you can make a brief comment. And that's the place, if you're just gonna write a sentence like, our laws are too, our laws are too weak, we need stronger laws to end extinction. Write it there that's great. They're going to deal with them as kind of passing comments and collate those. What we'd really love out of today from the people who have taken the time to call into this webinar, who are perhaps more engaged, who have got a bit of time to do a little bit of research, is a quality submissions. And you can make those by sending an email. And we'll be setting up um, something on our website where people can um, have a resource there that will help them actually write a submission and that will go into the review. Now, there's a few things, um, ways you can make that submission. You can respond to the questions the government is asking or the reviewer is asking, or you can just write your own thing. Um, and we'll probably be encouraging people just to like, say what they want to say. And so there's a few things you need to remember when you're making a, kind of a quality or a longer submission, not just a comment. Of course, you, know, you need to say who you are and why you care. Um, it's really valuable to draw on your own experiences, what I've seen, what I've heard, the issue that I've worked on, I have been doing X, Y, and Z, and this is why. If you can use evidence, especially evidence, and there will be links to evidence from environment lawyers in our guide, but you know, scientific evidence is great too. Of course, be polite and firm. They're gonna ignore a submission that's rude or you know uses the wrong kind of language. So no all caps shouting. No, all swear words. <laughs> um, but there's yep. three key points that we really want people to draw drive home in their submissions, and this is, kind of the, the key elements of the changes we need in our environment laws. The first is national leadership. So even though we have a national environment law, it only covers a handful of issues. And that's part of the problem because there's this split between local government and state government and federal government. And the strongest thing we need to see in our new environment laws, a stronger environment law, is a stronger role for the federal government, a stronger national leadership. And I could give you a long list of things that the government needs to, a federal government should take stronger leadership on, but these are the ones that stand out for me. Protecting what's called the critical habitat that our threatened species need to survive. Right now, we list species that are endangered on a list, but that means nothing, nothing else happens. We don't actually protect the habitat that need. That's the most important thing, single thing I think we can do. But we also need to make a recovery plan and the implementation of that plan mandatory. We've got many species that don't even have a plan for a recovery and the species that do, there's no money to fund those activities. It's mad. Another thing, another role for the federal government is to have emergency list, listing powers so that when damaging events like bushfires happen, that they can quickly act to look at the, the plight of a species and if necessarily uplist it. Um, or make it higher up the list of endangered. Um, look, there's so many things the federal government could do. One of them, of course, is national protection for national parks. Even though we call them national parks, they're actually run by state governments. And we're seeing state governments using national parks um, as business opportunities, actually. We're seeing the development of our national parks at unprecedented scale. And so protect, national protection national parks is critical. The one other key one I'd jump out at at national leadership is a climate trigger. 
At the moment, there's nothing in our environment laws that says the federal government should assess this coal mine based on how much carbon it's going to emit. At the moment, they can assess a coal mine if it impacts threatened species or if it impacts water or a migratory bird, but not if it's going to destroy the climate. So a climate trigger is critical. That's the first point, national leadership. The second point are the new institutions. Part of the problem with our environment laws is that they're so weakly enforced. Um, it's the Dep government department's role to do the enforcement, but we know the government department has had its budget cut by nearly half. And um, so often they're under political influence. So we want to see an independent environment protection agency to act as a kind of environmental watchdog, almost an environmental police on the beat to make sure strong laws are being enforced. But we need another body, a separate body, we're calling it a, an environment commission to actually set the standards for how much pollution is safe or how much habitat a, a species needs protected or to even just monitor how much habitat is left for a species because at the moment we don't even do that. So they're new institutions and independent institutions from government. And the third thing that the point that we really want people to drive home is that we need a say in what happens in these decisions. So at the moment, um, environmental decisions um, are made with very little transparency. And when they are made and they're terrible decisions, often there's no chance to actually challenge that decision on its merits. We can challenge it in court, as ACF has done many times successfully, that the decision didn't follow the right steps, but we can't actually challenge whether or not it was a good or bad decision. Another way that we want people to have a greater say over it is decision-making is to have what are called merit, and not merits reviews, third-party enforcement. This is very common in the States where if the government's not enforcing the law, an individual or a community group can say, hey, we know this corporation is polluting our river. The government's not doing anything about it. We'll take these guys to court. And in America, that happens and it actually forces the government to enforce its own laws. Yeah. Those two changes are critical, but even just greater transparency in our decision making, even just environmental information that's up to date so that we can all know the state of our environment. Those sorts of, we call that environmental justice. Mm -hmm. And that's a really key principle. Look, I could talk about this stuff all day. Yeah. Um, you can see I'm passionate about it. Yeah. But we're going to um, email people a submission guide. Yeah. Um, it'll be about a two-pager. It'll make some of these points and a few more. If you're really a nerd like some of us, um, we've got a 10-page guide. In fact, I think it's a 20-page guide that'll really go into the nuts and bolts. Yeah. So we really encourage you to make a quality submission. Um, put some work into it. Look, if you're just gonna make a comment, jump on their website and make a comment, yep. but it'd be great to have some quality submissions. The deadline is mid-April. I should know the date off the top of my head, but I don't. Um, it'll be in the email. Yeah, excellent. And we also encourage you to use that Facebook group, the ACF Nature Network, and jump in and we can also answer questions and help, um, help you through the process of submitting a submission, if that helps. Um, we have just a couple more minutes before we close. So we've talked about protect, restore, connect. Kelly, can I ask you a question from a person called James? James asks, what is a big bridging issue that conservative and left audiences care about and that we can use to unite us, to bring us together? Mm, great question. And we've done a lot of research um, in those communities to try and understand for this campaign for mm. nature what is a key bridging issue. We do that for our work in climate as well. Mm. Um, but there is one thing that um, is love of nature. Mm. And it's, um, I'm a scientist by training, so, and I actually have never got married because I don't want to say to the whole world <laughs> the word love out loud about my partner who I do adore. Um, <laughs> But I, I love watching how much people love nature. And it's actually, it's, it's actually something I'll talk about all the time now in the media and public commentary. It sounds like, mm, um, but it's actually the thing that brings so many people together. Um, and we will protect what we love, mm. and Carol. And the more that we love it, the more we feel, the more pain we feel. Yeah. And I think the thing we've got to really watch for at the moment is as people who are quite deeply knowledgeable about nature, climate change and the impacts. We can't respond by doing things that make us feel really good and mm -hmm. happy. Um, 
we actually have to respond with what we know is the thing that unites people, that works for people, whether it's city or country, old or young, Liberal, Labor, Greens, Independent, whatever you vote for. Mm -hmm. And that one thing is about loving the wombats and the kangaroos and the big old trees and the forest and the, the smell of gum leaves after rain. And if we can connect on that yeah. level with people, and through the types of things you've talked about, bring it back to our daily lives as well. Yeah. Um, so whether it's seeing the the, the bees um, come to you know the block or um, bring the maggies back or whatever it is that that we decide to do, um, we can build from there. But that's the foundation. I am so worried um, that in recent history it's more been about dividing the nation. I don't think ACF's tried to do that, but I I do fear sometimes that that is. A strategy of some groups and um, it's certainly what we're seeing in politics and that's not the answer. Yeah and I guess thinking about these local activities that you might run in your community which you know we'll send you lots more info on that later in February but I suppose people also can come to local community events for all kinds of different reasons. Mm -hmm. You know some might come because they want to get to know their neighbours or because they love cake or because they care about cleaning <laughs> yeah. up a creek so they can, you know, their kids can swim in it. Mm. But I feel like actually there's something in that, that nature's core to our identity in Australia. Yeah, it's actually what makes, in the research, our nature yeah. is what makes Australia, Australia. Yeah. So if we can get to people on that level, we can do everything else. And I just want, I saw another quick question in there about how do we help people um, stop the division between jobs and protecting nature mm -hmm. and the economy and nature. And we can, like I, I know I'm talking about love, but this is an organisation who was the first organisation in Australia to have economists working for us. We still have them. Mm -hmm. We are very strategic and very serious about breaking down um, the economic reasons why you should protect nature as well. Mm -hmm. And we will have that work there. But you know, that actually every treasurer, every business CEO, every bank manager, they're also a person, they have kids and they love some critter out there. Mm -hmm. So connecting on both the head and the heart level is something we do really a lot here. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know that we, they, we we will be working on this actually, if we can protect nature, we can solve help solve the climate problem, we can make this country better, we'll make this country healthier, we'll strengthen our economy. Mm -hmm. So all those things we will talk through, but the love thing, it gets everyone across the line, no matter who you are. Yeah. So we've heard a lot of interesting ideas today. Nature love, connecting, growing people power, protecting the places that really, really matter, wildlife. All of these things feel like there's lots more conversations for us to have together. So once again, I encourage you to join the Facebook group if you're on Facebook. Um, it's called ACF Nature Network and we'll send you all the details after this. Um, if you're not on Facebook, don't worry, there are plenty of other ways to connect with the community and this is just the very beginning of this campaign. Um, I find it kind of extraordinary that on a Thursday afternoon at lunchtime, we have several hundred people jumping on a webinar from all across this Australia to hear about what we can do together, how we can really turn things around for our communities and for nature. It actually gives me a lot of energy. You know, it's been a tiring month, really, a couple of months. Yeah, and seeing definitely. so many people so keen to roll up their sleeves and get, get to work is really extraordinary. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our members and our donors especially um, for all of your generosity and all of your commitment over the years and the months. Um, it's really extraordinary and it's what makes campaigning like this possible. And I'd like to thank our speakers Thanks so much, Carol, for sharing your advice and your insights and for giving, you know, for sharing so generously some coping strategies that we can all use together to connect and keep going. And thanks to Kelly and to Jess. Um, and thanks to everybody on the call, to all of you wonderful people for joining in. Um, we really, really look forward to sending emails and making this a really exciting, big campaign that is urgent and fast, but also deep and brings all the people in that we really, really need to bring in. I feel like this moment that we're in right now, it feels to me like people are desperate for things to do. People are really looking to join and to make this decade, this pivotal decade, a decade of innovation and creativity and connection. Um, and I think actually we don't have a choice. I think we have to roll up our sleeves and come together and make the world a better place.
Luckily enough, human humans have done that so many times. In yep. one single decade, they've transformed our imagination, our technology, our ability to put footprints on moon dust. You know, we yep. can do. We had the answers here, yep. and and if we can build that people power, then we can do anything in that ten years that we've got ahead of us. Yep. Excellent. Thanks very much for joining us. Do you have any final comments, Jess? Other than thank you. <laughs> So thanks very much. There's lots of conversations in the chat. If you have a question that we didn't manage to answer, um, feel free to send us an email or jump yep. into the Facebook group. Thank you. Thanks, um, everyone. Stay tuned. We'll be in touch soon. Bye. 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 Bye.